back everyone to our fourth and last lecture of the day. Thanks, Gabriel. Yeah. Um, okay, I can't attach it. I'm just going to leave it here. Hopefully it's loud enough for, for the Zoom. Okay, so let's continue with our matrix algebras. And like Bill's uh, uh, talk this morning, this is also sort of uh, going to be a cry for help. For help moving things. <laughs> uh, but I need to, I guess, specify what it is I need help with. So that's uh, going to be the goal of today's lecture to specify what it is I would like help with. So mostly this. Um, so, so just to remind ourselves, I can define a kth extension, which is some matrix algebra that, yeah, that, that uh, yeah, you look like you, you, you had a uh, something on the tip of your tongue. So it's the kth extension of some cellular algebra, mostly a cellular algebra of a, of a, of a graph, the smallest uh, the cellular closure of its adjacency matrix, and then, or, or coherent algebra, sorry, that what we're going with. And then this uh, W um, to the curly braces of, of K is, um, is some K extension, which contains the, the K full Kronecker product. Um, but it is much bigger than just the chronicle product, which would not contain any extra special information. In particular, we add this delta identity here, which uh, no, the notes are now posted. So if you do need to refresh your definition of what that was, uh, I will not do it. You can, you can check. Okay, but for this cape extension, um, we still want this weak isomorphism between these coherent algebras. And now, not only do we need them to be weakly isomorphic, we want that the weak isomorphism between the smaller coherent algebras to be extendable to this, um, to be a weak isomorphism of the bigger coherent algebras. And if that does happen for two graphs x and y, we say that the graphs x and y are k equivalent. Okay, so that's the, the thing. Uh, and then how does this uh, fit into the big picture of things? So how does it fit into the big picture of things? Well, this is, uh, let me write the, the, the theorem in the original paper that, that uh, defined these, uh, one of the original papers on Marenko that defined these algebras. So what they showed is, well, they show a more complicated statement, but since we're interested, we've spent some time on the k-dimensional bispalar Lehman algorithm, and we're just discussing the distinguishing of graphs by a certain spectra, uh, I'm just going to state it in the most simple way possible, but not the most precise way. So it has two parts. So if the k-dimensional Bailey Lehman does not distinguish x and y, then they're going to be like uh, m equivalent for some value of m. And the value is the floor of k over 3 are going to be uh, slash l floor. So they are this many uh, equivalent. And then also, if they are uh, x and y, the other direction is a little bit better. So if x and y are k equivalent, uh, then uh, the Okay, then the k-dimensional by Spaler Lehman algorithm does not distinguish them. Okay, so what they actually show is that um, if you look at the so the by Spaler Lehman, it sort of computes some things. It computes um, a coherent configuration, and the coherent algebra of that configuration lives between the k over thirds extension and the k extension. So uh, they prove a, a stronger thing, but in terms of distinguishing graphs and these algebras being equivalent, this is sort of a summary of, of what it is. That's sort of the significance of this. And the other significance is due to Jamie Smith in his PhD thesis, theorem, for the discrete quantum walk. If we recall that there was some eigenvalue of some large matrix associated with a discrete time quantum walk that was proposed to distinguish strongly regular graphs, for which Cribs and I and Tor found a counterexample with very laborious computation, uh, that thing, it also lives in this hierarchy in some way. And it's sort of the reason why I chose to present this sort of algebra instead of the Weisspieler Lehman algebra. So, uh, what Jamie showed is that if X and Y are two equivalent. This is a very low requirement. Equivalent. So we're only in the two-dimensional thing. So the tooth extension there, it's just um, the original adjacency matrix um, uh, times itself. 
So a twofold Kronecker product. So it will be something that is uh, indexed by, by the number of pairs of vertices. If there are two equivalents, then uh, that matrix S, if we compute it for the vertex X, sorry, for the graph X and S of Y are cospectral. In fact, he shows much more, shows uh, more than this. So the, the original M's algorithm is you take the transition matrix for the discrete time upon a Y, you take the third power, and then you do this positive support uh, operation, wherein you replace all the positive entries with one and all the other entries with zero. So you zero out everything that was negative. Um, what he shows is that the positive support of any power of the transition matrix not distinguish the graphs. And this is if there are two equivalents. So now this reduces the problem of finding graphs that are two equivalents. So we know that because this, uh, that we've already seen some uh, connection, right? So this previous lemma or theorem, it, it tells us a connection between the vice Bayesian algorithm and these KB extensions. And you know that for each K, there is a pair of graphs who are not distinguished by the K-dimensional vice Bayesian. So that means that for each of our K, different K here, there is also some pair of graphs whose uh, K extensions are equivalent, K equivalent. So um, those will surely give counterexamples to this, uh, this algorithm. But the problem is that it's very difficult if, if we look at the constructions of how you get graphs who are K equivalent, those things tend not to be strongly regular or even distance regular. So um, yeah, there are very many close calls. And tomorrow, I think I want to continue my plea for help and tell you about all these graphs who are not distinguished by the spectrum of this matrix and who are therefore very good candidates to be two equivalent. But we've not shown that any of them are two equivalent. Yeah. So what is the positive support? Oh, yeah, so that's the thing where you take the matrix and then you replace all the positive entries with one and all the negative entries with zero. So that's the operation that they're doing because the original transition matrix, its eigenvalues are just determined by the eigenvalues of the graph for a regular graph. So any power of it also will have this property. You don't get new eigenvalue information. So the transition matrix, it will, its spectrum won't be able to distinguish anything that the adjacency matrix is not able to distinguish. But after they do this very brutal operation of considering where the positive and negative entries are, they make some matrix, which is a zero one matrix, non symmetric and dense in many cases, which is not uh, determined by the adjacency matrix. And this is somewhat, somewhat of a brutal operation. It's not an operation that, that belongs uh, nicely in our usual association schemes. None of the operations, uh, yeah, because it's sort of, yeah, it's just not a, a nice operation usually, which is why it's very hard. Um, so though this gives, um, let me just write that though, this gives us that there are um, pairs of graphs that for each K, there are pairs of graphs which are not distinguished by uh, the spectra of this S matrix from M's at all. Um, it is still very difficult to find um, strongly regular pairs, aside from the painful computation that, that we have to do. Uh, well, it wasn't painful, it, but it was very intense. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I do not know of any pair of strongly regular graphs who are too equivalent. Are there strongly regular graphs? Are there pairs, pairs, strongly regular, which are too equivalent? This I also am not really sure. I, I, don't. I know what I think should happen. So I would con conjecture that if the graph is, <clears throat> if you have a pair of triply regular graphs, like we saw in Akihiro's talk this morning that I'm about to define, I would conjecture that if you have such a pair, then they should be, I guess now we have triply regular graphs. It's like very on point because I'm the third speaker today to, to have this in my talk, right? But you're the uh, only one who didn't? Yeah, okay, so triply regular graphs. Um, 
I, I don't know if this is the correct level of depth for the for, for this audience, but I, I thought that we should maybe define them since uh, we've not really gone into the definition yet. And so that the non-experts can have a foothold, I wanted to start kind of from the beginning. Uh, so what is the beginning of triply regular graphs? Well, it's you know distance regular graphs. So one can consider uh, automorphisms of graphs. All right, was an automorphism of a graph? Uh, well, B is an automorphism of a graph X if what? What does B have to do? If B is a permutation of uh, the vertices such that uh, edges are mapped to it. The set of all automorphisms uh, is denoted, uh, is uh, forms a group, a group um, which we denote odd x. I hope this is, uh, no, odd x. Oh, yes, okay. Already a macro. All right, so it's, it's a group. So now um, you have this group of automorphisms. You can think of them as permutations of the vertices. You can think of them, um, they're its equivalent to the n by n permutation matrices, which commute with the um, uh, matrix algebra. But uh, one can, uh, so equivalently, odd x, the, uh, yeah, it's the group of permutation matrices uh, indexed by the vertex set um, in V of x times V of x, uh, which commute with the adjacency matrix. But now you can consider any graph, act, uh, no, any group acting, you can consider a group action on your graph by taking a homomorphism from any group into the automorphism group. But that's the, the thing. So now uh, we can consider the group actions on uh, our graph. Uh, these will just be the homomorphisms, homomorphisms from group G to odd x. So in general, uh, we are considering permutations of the vertices, okay? So we consider uh, permutations, I mean, that's what I used in my definition. We consider permutations of the vertices. So it's natural uh, to think of the groups uh, action, the group action as being on the vertices, but it's not true. It acts on, uh, I mean, it is true, but <laughs> it's not the only thing. It acts on very many other things as well. So if you have some group acting on your graph, it also acts on the pairs of vertices of your graph. And if your graph is embedded in some surface, the group action also induces some group action on the embedding. Okay, so the, the uh, uh, any group action on the graph also acts on the pairs of vertices. So what I mean is that suppose you have your group element G, uh, I can define G of X, Y. This is a pair of vertices. It's just the pair that will be G of X, G of Y. So this is uh, how G acts on a pair of vertices. The orbitals, orbitals of the graph are the orbits of uh, V times V, the, the pairs of vertices uh, under the, the action of the automorphism group. Uh, the orbits of V of X cross V of X uh, under the action of the automorphism group. Okay, so how many orbitals are there? Do there have to be? Uh, what's the lower bound of the number of orbitals? So the pairs of vertices. Can it be transitive upon the set of pairs? It cannot be because, can I Yeah, because those pairs that are x, x, they can never be mapped to some x, y when y is not x. So definitely you have some diagonal, but it's actually more than this because if you have some pair of vertices, at distance i from each other, you cannot map them to some other pair that is at a different distance. So there are at least a diameter plus one many orbits, right? So uh, since we cannot map a pair x, y at distance i from each other to uh, a pair u, v at distance j not equal to i, there are at least d plus one orbitals uh, where D is the diameter of the graph. So if there are exactly this minimum number of orbitals and the graph is said to be distance transitive, 
So if there are exactly d plus one orbitals, then the graph is said to be distance transitive. That's what we have. So what does it mean to be distance transitive? There are d plus one orbitals. That means if you have any pair of vertices at some distance i, you can map it to any other pair. But that means that all the combinatorial properties of those pairs of vertices, for example, the number of neighbors at some prescribed distance from each other, those had better be the same because I'm able to map any to the other. So in this respect, um, sort of in, in this uh, setting, we can consider uh, since regular graphs perhaps to be the sort of like a combinatorial relaxation of just being distance transitive to be the combinatorial relaxation of being distance transitive. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you are distance regular, then maybe there is no automorphism that takes every pair to any other pair, but uh, the numbers of neighbors and the numbers of uh, things at distance J, that will be correct. That will be feasible. It would be possible for such a thing to exist um, or rather not immediately ruled out by counting. Okay. So, uh, and in the same way, we're now going to de define uh, distance, you know, tri triply transitive. So, is there like a quote unquote easy example of something that is distance trans or distance right over the opposite transitive? Um, yes, the Hadamard graphs that um, that um, Akihiro had this morning, many of them are not distance transitive. Um, so many of the graphs you know are indeed distance transitive. So for example, our favorite friends, the Peterson graph, the Peterson graph, the Higman Sims graph. Who else did we meet today? The Klipsch graph. And basically any graph of which you know the name <laughs> and most <laughs> other named graphs uh, are in fact Distance transitive. Yeah, Hawking Singleton graph is distance transitive. Yeah, so anything with a name, probably distance transitive, except those pseudo graph things. Okay, so, uh, okay, let's say name for person, then distance transitive. But there are many examples of this distance regular, non distance transitive graphs. How, um, so, for example, um, what's a good example? I think it's even shown that most uh, strongly regular graphs do not have any non-trivial automorphisms. So most of them will be non-distance transitive. Um, but a specific example is very difficult. The Shrikanda graph is not distance transitive, but it's all that it's little friend is or not. The Rook graph is distance transitive, but the Shrikanda graph is, is, distance, is not distance transitive. Okay, but also if you take all these orthogonal arrays, many of them have trivial automorphism groups. So uh, let me just write that. So many um, uh, Latin square graphs and, and uh, have trivial automorphism groups. So graphs are distance regular of diameter two, but not distance transit. In terms of distance regular graphs, uh, many of the ones that I could hear are the Hadamard graphs, they're also non-distance transitive, though they are basically everything. And also the pair that we have, this GQ Q squared Q that I will talk about more um, tomorrow. Uh, one of them, the classical object, that one is a ring two graph, it's distance transitive, and its cospectral mate is not even vertex transitive. So it has two orbits, one of which has size six, and the other one is very large. Okay. So uh, they are somewhat rare. And um, but I think that it's just because the way that Historically, we as a field have constructed these graphs is via even nicer al uh, algebraic objects, groups, and, and fields, and um, well, finite fields and uh, geometries. So I think it's just an artifact of how we constructed these graphs that we only see distance transitive ones. So somehow these uh, uh, abnormal graphs are a little bit hard. Okay, so um, the automorphism group of a graph, graph also uh, acts on the triples of vertices. Okay, order triples, maybe three triples would be a more descriptive term. <laughs> uh, what about the orbits of this action? 
Okay, so exactly in the distance transitive in this previous case with these orbitals, suppose you have some vertices x, y, and z. Can you map them to u, v, and w? So if like x is equal to y, but two of the u, v, they're not equal to each other, then you can't map them, right? So uh, suppose we have u, v, w, and x, y, z. Okay, when can you map the first triple to the second triple? So if u is equal to v, but x is not equal to z, then you can't map them because I don't allow you to put the triples, right? So they have to be equal in the same places. And then if u is adjacent to v, but x is not adjacent to z, that's also gonna be a no-no. So basically you can only map them to each other feasibly uh, if you are able to, to, to map one to the other, uh, then uh, uh, x, y, z, if they are in the same orbit, then the pairwise distances have to be equal. And uh, so you get a whole bunch of things being equal now. So the distance between x, y, so here's the first two things. So the distance between x, y has to equal the distance between u, v, the distance between y, z. This has to equal the distance between v, w, and the distance between z and x has to equal the distance between u and w, right? The first and the last. So basically you can partition the triples of vertices based on the pairwise distances. And the orbit partition of triples must be a refinement of this partition, okay? So we can partition uh, the triples of vertices and uh, maybe three tuple, I'm gonna write triples, of uh, vertices uh, by the pairwise distances. The orbit partition must be a refinement of this partition. And then if it is equal to this partition, then the graph is said to be triply regular. It is said to be regular uh, if uh, it is, uh, uh, if this is the orbit partition. This partition by the pairwise distances gives you the orbit partition of that group, okay? So <clears throat> in particular, again, just like we had for the distance regular case, now we get a whole bunch of extra things. So hopefully this diagram is gonna work. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that suppose I take three vertices, uh, x, y, okay, and z. So any triple must look the same because I'm able to map them to each other. Um, so, but let's write the distances, the pairwise distance of them. So it's x, y, z, and their pairwise distances are uh, i, j, and k. Now every triple looks the same. So now if I look at some group of vertices, the group of vertices who are um, distance r from x, distance s from y, and distance uh, s, t from z, this number had better be the same regardless the choice of triple and the choice of r, s, and t. So suppose I look at those things that are r from my vertex s, x, s, distance s, S, okay, from my vertex Y and distance T from my vertex Z. This number had better be a constant for all the triples if they are transitive. And we are going to call this number P, I, J, K. Oh, I should have done LMN. Okay. I, J, K, and then in the superscript, R, S, T. Some triple intersection parameter. Uh, I think somebody used M for this earlier today, and it, this is how it comes about. And then, oh, sorry, this is triply transitive. Did that fix the consternation? So in this setting, uh, in uh, triply regular is, a, is the combinatorial relaxation of this property. So uh, the definition is that a graph regular uh, if, um, if those PIJK RSTs exist. If these parameters P, I, J, K, RST uh, exist, which I mean that they are constants and they do not depend on the choice of triple, okay? So that means that combinatorially, there's no immediate reason why there cannot be an automorphism that sends each triple to each other triple. The automorphism doesn't have to exist, but at least you cannot rule it out by counting stuff. This is uh, the definition of triply regular. Okay, so there are also examples of triply regular graphs. So examples of triply regular graphs. Well, Paul has a full characterization in his mind. 
but what are some things? The cube is triply regular. Line graph of K and N. Hadamard graphs from this morning. So they're uh, of, of uh, diameter four. I think from Hadamard designs, you get also a graph of diameter three. But these Hadamard graphs, they're the ones that are bar blah, bipartite antipodal of diameter four. It's four mod self dual. Um, who else is triply regular? Yes, that double cover of the, the double cover of the Higman Sims from this morning. Any and the Smith graph, so any strongly regular graph where uh, Q, the prime parameter QII I is equal to zero for, for, um, for I equals one or two. This is the result of Kamler, Hutzels, and Seidels. So um, their result is that you're a triply regular, strongly regular graph if and only if the seconds, if the sub constituents of any vertex are also strongly regular graphs. So uh, the Klipsch graph is also the Klipsch graph is also uh, really regular. The um, but in the Klipsch graph, so you know that because it's triply regular and strongly regular, if you look at a vertex, you look at the things at distance one, that has to give you a strongly regular graph, and you look at the things at distance two, that also has to give you a strongly regular graph. So depending on which thing you think is the Klipsch graph, um, that second subconstituent is the Peterson graph. And there's some other tower where uh, all the things, the uh, I think the second subconstituent of the Schleckley graph is also something interesting. So there are all these towers of, of graphs. Um, and also maybe for us, if you have generalized quadrangle, so the generate quadrangle, the point graph of GQ, uh, uh, Q, Q squared, Q, Q squared, I think, um, is uh, also triply regular. <laughs> It's really tr uh, triply transitive. So also half, half graph of the hyper half cube. I'm inserting it right here. Half cube. The folded cube also? No folded cube? But I actually believe that in your classification, all bipartite antipodal of diameter four. That's correct. Exactly Aren't there others no. in the class? No. They're only had more graphs. But their antipodal classes are only of size two. Can there be antipodal classes of size three? Uh, I see. I see. Okay. So I think that it's safe to conjecture the following. Oh, okay. It's an environment that if X and Y are triply transitive, oh, sorry, triply regular, and those triple intersection numbers are the same, then they are two equivalent. But this is, uh, we have not proved it. And also, I'm not sure how, how, to, how to do this. Mostly because the things living in, in, in W squared are so weird. Okay. But because of this desperation, uh, there is something that we, that we can do. We can talk about other matrix algebras for which we know that they are weakly isomorphic. To two triply regular graphs of the same intersection array will be triply, uh, sorry, will be equivalent, weakly isomorphic. And <clears throat> so we are fleeing to a section called other matrix algebras. So somehow this matrix algebra is the one that captures the information in uh, this graph invariant coming from the discrete time quantum walk. And then it also is it also is able to capture the information from the k-dimensional vice Baylor Lehman. Um, but it's kind of hard to show that two graphs are even two equivalent. Two is the lowest number that is not just the actual Boltzmann algebra of the graph, right? Uh, so at the first level where it's not trivial. And this is hard. Uh, the other matrix algebra that I'm about to show you, I think it's it's uh, known. First of all, it's known. Um, some about uh, triply regular graphs that they're going to be weakly isomorphic, but uh, we don't know how it interacts with this k dimensional by Spiller Lehman. We don't know how it interacts with this uh, S plus here. Okay, so that's sort of the, 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 the plea for help of um, some things need to be resolved. So, what are some other matrix algebras for which we know um, very little stuff? Jajar algebras which have been mentioned, but I think not defined yet. 
or does everyone know what they are? Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, so <clears throat> the first subsection, Jajer. Um, so Jajer studied them in, in, in the context of studying um, in the context of studying spin models, but it's possible that they have been defined before by Paul. Um, but definitely he shows uh, that J3 is a sum of all of the Twilliger algebras. <clears throat> but let's just um, uh, do the definition and you can discuss with Bill Martin afterwards. <laughs> Uh, Jajer studied these, and many people think he studied them first um, in, in the context, but they may have appeared before. So we consider uh, a symmetric association scheme, uh, curly A, and the bases are A0 to AD. So now we're in like a legitimate symmetric association scheme, has all the nice properties. We're not just in some potentially ugly Boseman's or ugly cellular or coherent algebra anymore. We're in a legitimate setting <clears throat> to do uh, association schemes. And now for each uh, AI, or rather for, for, for these elements, um, we can define, we will, there the following endomorphisms. So, Morphisms of the set of V by V matrices, where N is the, the size matrices over C. So we're going to do it in the most lazy way possible. So X sub I is the map that takes a matrix to AI, but to left multiplication by the matrix AI. And Y sub I, uh, right multiplication so it sends a matrix m to its image under right multiplication by the matrix ai and the last one is for some reason uh delta and not z delta i of m and it sends it to the image under entry wise product with ai so it sends m to a sub i circ Sure. Okay. So these are endomorphisms. You can see that this is basically given by matrix multiplication. The action is given by ma matrix multiplication. So it will respect uh, the, the, the underlying uh, linear algebra. So it will be endomorphisms of the n by n matrices. And then, um, yeah, so you get a bunch of these um, endomorphisms. And now I want to take algebras that are generated by these operators. So these are operators on the n by n matrices. Um, if you want to consider, so n is the size of the matrix. So each a i is n by n. So the, the other way that you can you can think about it is um, x i. You can put the matrix into like a n squared by one vector by stacking all the columns of this n by n matrix. Right. So the matrix is transformation for x i. It will be like n squared by n squared. So you can consider these to be matrices that live in a really huge matrix space, n squared by n squared with entries in C. So that's uh, the way that I prefer to think about it since I prefer matrices. Or you can think of them as abstract endomorphisms. And now we, we take an algebra over, over this concept. Okay. So now we now we define the Jajer algebras. So the Jajer algebra. Uh, whose name is J2, uh, is generated by uh, just the X size, X0 up to XD. So the next one, the joys of LaTeX, look, magic. <laughs> J3, it's generated by these and some other stuff. So it's generated by this with the deltas. With So it's left multiplication plus entry-wise multiplication. So delta sub zero. And finally, the last Jajer algebra, J4, is just generated by all of them. So this and, and also the yi's, y zero up to yd. So this is the three Jajer algebras. Don't ask me why they started. So um, perhaps you think that the, the, the that first one is just a bunch of Boseman's or algebra, right? Because you're only multiplying by matrices and we started in an association scheme. So uh, this operator should, should have a basis. Um, so it should only be n by n. And I believe that that is, so this J2 is okay, is what we're gonna put. 
However, this other operation with this other uh, matrix multiplication, it will give you more things. So this J3 will be a more complicated object. But uh, thanks to, to Williger, we, we do know what, what it is in terms of Williger algebras. So here is a theorem. Sorry, Paul, I don't know the year. I wrote it down, but uh, it didn't make it onto the piece of paper. Uh, 89, 83, 82? 92. Oh, okay. So the set, oh, okay, well, well, maybe you want to see the statement of what I'm going to write here. <laughs> we just put a random number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah zero equals one. That's not enough simple. <laughs> The set of simple modules of uh, modules of J3, CJ3 is the disjoint union, the simple modules of, um, no, no, for each of the Twilliger algebras, respect to every vertex, uh, T of X, for X uh, in the ground set, for distance regular graph, I guess. So maybe this is X in V of X for graph. But you, uh, so basically that J3, it will just be determined by the disjoint union. It itself will be determined by the disjoint union of all of the possible Twilliger algebras. So you get one Twilliger algebra per choice of vertex. And if you take the union of all of them, you get J3. So that means that if you're triply regular, J3s will be uh, weakly isomorphic. When you're triply regular, each Twilliger algebra is first of all the same. They're weakly isomorphic to each other. And then when you take the union, you don't get uh, uh, much more than what you get from the uh, triple intersection parameters. So the following follows directly. There is a proof in the, uh, I'm not sure if it's due to Jamie Smith, but there is a proof in his thesis. Uh, if X, I think uh, it also follows from a note of Akihiro um, where he finds uh, the basis um, for a simple module of the Twilliger algebra of a triply regular graph. And from that, you can also see that this is true. So um, uh, if X and Y are triply regular, if the same uh, inter triple intersection parameters, then uh, they their J3 algebras are uh, weakly isomorphic in the sense that we've defined. Okay, so... This is sort of uh, where I wanted to end today with a plea for help. So these algebras, they seem to be uh, easier to think about combinatorially in terms of in terms of counts in the graph, which is why it's possible to prove these things. But um, I don't know um, how to approach this two equivalence. Maybe the best thing to do is to try to show that, uh, well, okay. So the best thing to do would have been to show that the, um, the W2s, the second extension, lives inside J3, or maybe even inside J4. But I, I think that that's not true. I think that it doesn't have to live inside J3 for non triply regular graphs, at least. And yeah, so it, there, there maybe the next sort of theorem that would be nice to prove is um, some relation between this hierarchy of the of the the case extension of the Boltzmann zero algebras and with these uh, Jaeger algebras, sort of the, the open problem, of, or to directly show for some paragraphs who are triply regular with the same triple intersection numbers that the the, um, the that they're too equivalent. Okay. So I will stop here. You, you don't know the pair of strongly regular, not as far as strongly regular, but you could say. You, no, uh, I know. Yeah, yeah. No, that, oh, wait. Two equivalent. Two equivalent, yes. Uh, there is a family in James' thesis when he proved this. He constructed some regular graphs with four eigenvalues. Super close. No, four eigenvalues. Regular graphs with four eigenvalues. So, so my question is, do you know strong regular graphs that are too equivalent to that? So that would solve, I think, both of them, right? It would solve both this, um, I think it would solve both of this uh, M's invariance. It would give such a pair. And also it would give a, a pair for the symmetric powers. Then that would give a, a pair of, of graphs who's, who are not determined by the eigenvalues of the symmetric K power when K is bigger than two. So that uh, that would submit k equals three. I think that would be. So the two GQs that we used to for those numbers, they are they are 
They are triply regular with the same triple intersection numbers. They are too big for me to deal with this. They are too big to compute this, this big algebra of. Um, I don't know if they are too equivalent. However, I do know that um, there are some small graphs on which this M procedure fails. They are not regular. I mean, sorry, they are regular, but they're not strongly regular or distance regular or anything. So there are pairs on 14 vertices, 18 vertices, 20 vertices that you can compute. And these little graphs, they are not even, um, they're not even isomorphic. Like the algebras are not even weakly isomorphic. The base one is not even weakly isomorphic. So they're not too equivalent. They're not any equivalent, equivalent for any K, but they do have the same algebra. So it's not necessarily a condition, but also um, these vice failure, um, and the infinite family of graphs who are pairwise k equivalents, I think that from any graph of degree k, you can construct a pair of graphs that will be, um, or maybe not distinguishable by the vice failure element algorithm of level k. So that will make it whatever equivalent it was by the by the theorem. Um, those are very far from strongly regular as well. They are also un indistinguished by the algorithm. They are triply regular of the same parameters. No, we, I don't know. So even then, it's very big. The first Hadamard, the first order for which there are non Hadamard equivalent Hadamard matrices is 16. So on uh, on 16 by 16, there are different Hadamard matrices. Before, they're all Hadamard equivalent. There's only two, four, eight. All right. So there aren't any. So there are four. There are five non-equivalent Hadamard matrices on Neil Sloan's website, but one of them is the transpose of the other. So they produce only four non-isomorphic graphs. Mm -hmm. So these things are not distinguished by the M's procedure, mm -hmm. probably because the conjecture is probably correct that they're too equivalent because they're triply regular. Um, but we don't know if they're triply regular. So those already it's 64 by 64. So computing these, these things are, is not, not, not a, it's really big. It's 64 vertices of degree 16. So to compute the, cl the closure of those matrices is it's very, yeah. Oh, J4 doesn't play a role for the two that I've named, but some other multi-particle walk where uh, the transition matrix of it, if you take the entry, then not even the eigenvalues, just the entry that appear in this matrix, uh, it was proposed that this would distinguish strongly regular graphs, and it also performs very well for small strongly regular graphs. And that thing lives in J4. But also, it would be solved by some equivalents, and again, it's hard to find strongly regular graphs that are K equivalent for any K. <laughs> has, has anybody ever worked out the irreducible modules for the JJL for J4? Any example? Uh, yeah, so Jamie did in his thesis. He worked out the irreducible modules for J4 and J3 for the, for his family that he, that he made. Um, I'm not really sure. So for a certain family of graphs, he, he worked out. Yeah. Get a reason one. Yes. And they, they work. And what graphs? No, no, they weren't triply regular. Um, it was a non-strongly regular graph. And then the other one is a twist. The other one is a Gotts on case switching of the previous one. So I don't remember how he constructed them, but uh, yeah, they are not distance regular or distance translated or anything. So what about the modes for distance regular? I don't know of any. Um, of J4, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, but, but I don't know of any. Yeah. Doesn't mean very much, <laughs> but the fact that you don't know either is also is a bit more damning. <laughs> I'm not aware of any J three. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a union all the really algebra. But also, um, I'm not sure it's sufficient for the J three algebra to be weakly isomorphic for it to be too equivalent. Like I don't think that containment is true. I don't think J3, I don't think W2 is contained in J3. I think the other way is true. The J3 is contained in the W2. And I think you can probably show that the J4 contains W2, the second extension. So we would need to find like uh, two things. Let's check the J4 options are also there. So, but that I think is, that I think is doable to show that J4 contains the other.
It's everything. So I think it's. Okay. We'll get more questions. Let's thank Crystal again.